Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the presentation portion of Virtual Bird Bash with Gulf Coast Bird Observatory. Right now, we have our executive director of Gulf, Gulf Coast Bird Observatory, Martin Hogna. He's going to be talking about bird strikes and other human-made threats. Um, the comment section is open, and I will be monitoring that for questions. So if you have any questions for Martin, um, you can put those in the chat, and I will uh, ask him those at the end. So without further ado, wel welcome, Martin. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm glad that you can join us on this Sunday morning and um, be part of Bird Bash for this year. Um, I know it's early Sunday morning. I really appreciate you guys being here and not out bird watching. Uh, it's going to be a talk about bird strikes, as Celeste said, and other human made threats. And if you do have questions, please do send in your comments. Uh, some of these can be somewhat controversial and, and maybe a little touchy for, for people. So um, it's maybe not a, uh, one of those subjects that's uh, all heartwarming and uh, you know uh, all smiles. Um, but it is something that I think we need to pull some attention to because uh, being a bird is a lovely thing. Wouldn't you want to be out there soaring in the skies and enjoying it all, looking down, um, you know, having a great time chirping with the other birds? But quite frankly, it is a really tough life out there for a bird. Uh, there's roughly 20 billion birds at any given time that live in the U.S., and for them to survive to an old age is probably rather rare in their world. Um, most of them don't live more than a few years. Uh, five years might be old uh, for you know, certain birds, although in captivity and some birds in the wild have not been known to live much, much longer, um, as well as certain species that have lived to be uh, 80 and so forth. But uh, for the most part, most birds, especially songbirds, have a very relatively short and rough life. Uh, and, and part of that is mother nature herself is not necessarily all that kind. Uh, predators like other birds, owls and uh, you know, raptors, uh, mammals, reptiles, they're all hungry and they're all looking for a meal and a lot of them eat birds uh, or eggs. Um, inclement weather by itself. Um, I don't know what your weather is like there, but today here is storming and raining and uh, cold, extreme heat. It all takes a toll and food and water and, and nesting sources can be scarce under certain conditions. So it's not necessarily easy to be that lovely bird that you see out there. And there is an awful lot of man-made threats. Um, out of those 20 billion birds in the U.S., estimated that well over 4.5 billion birds are, are estimated to die uh, from a human cost threat every year in the United States. So, you know, that is a large chunk of the living bird population in the U.S. every year that die from something that is caused or presented by, by us. And is that really sustainable? Is that really something that can keep on going? And there is many reasons for it, but the man-made objects and the man-made causes are a big part. We've lost over 70% of our birds in the last 30 years. Uh, and I'm not talking about species, but bulk of number of birds. So 70% uh, in 30 years is a huge and alarming number. Um, that is, it's really scary. And if that keeps going, it's, it's not a good thing. So. So let's take a look um, at some of the causes. And, and I hate to be here on Sunday morning and being the downer for everybody, uh, but I hope to offer some hope and some solutions. Um, but it, it really is a tough, sad reality. And so I would like to create more awareness. And we at Gulf Coast Bird Observatory see some of these things every day. We're reminded of it every day as we're working in the field or even in the office. And so it comes to our forefront, but for many people are not aware or maybe not uh, something that they see very often, if at all. And so we just wanna talk about it a little bit. And some of these things um, that is 
really a huge cost is windows on buildings. Uh, some 1 billion birds are estimated to die from window collisions each year in the United States. And we're gonna talk more about what that entails and maybe how we can fix some of that. Uh, but we're talking about homes with large or many windows, two-story homes that have large you know, bay windows or what have you, or a lot of windows, commercial buildings uh, that have large or many windows and, and also are lit up at night. And then there is the cities with the skyscrapers and the many taller buildings, which also have many windows. They're also very tall and way up there. Uh, and they all are lit up at night as well. And those are all issues that we're gonna go over here shortly. So uh, I wanna give credit to Heidi Trudell, who uh, actually studies this uh, in detail, actually works with this. This is what she does. And, and uh, she was kind enough to lend me a few of her slides and pictures. Uh, so I wanna make sure that um, y'all look her up and, and take a look at some of her work that she's done with, uh, with the issues and the solutions offered. And home windows. So if you're sitting at home, you're looking at your window, you see this beautiful scenery and, and it's nice and green and lush outside. Well, if you look outside looking in, oftentimes you see a lot of those reflections. And that is what a bird sees. They see from the, what's outside in that window because that window reflects the outside oftentimes. And so they think they're flying in between trees, not into a house or into a window. And which results in a strike on the window. Uh, yes, some birds bounce right off and fly away. Uh, but the sad part is, and, and the studies show that a lot of those birds that even bounce off and fly away or fall to the ground and then recover actually have internal injuries that, that very soon uh, will not allow them to live any longer. And so it, it's, it is, um, you know, lucky that a few birds that hit will survive and go on. Many of them don't. Uh, and that's the reason that they fly into these windows. You can see here on the picture that you're seeing trees and you're seeing sky in those windows. If I was a bird, I would say, hey, okay, I'm just gonna fly through there. Uh, and then the other window here that's all dark, oftentimes underneath porches or in dark passageways, uh, they see something that looks like an opening in the house. And so they're gonna fly through it or try to fly through it. And then they strike the window again. There is a couple of solutions or there's really quite a few solutions and, and some of them more tested than others. Uh, one of them is what's called bird tape. And this is by the American Bird Conservancy or ABC. Uh, they have it available on their website. You can use Google ABC bird tape. I'm sure you'll find it. Um, we have used this at Gulf Coast Bird Observatory. We did have window strikes at our windows. And since we had it put up, some of our wonderful volunteers uh, helped us put it up. And after they've been put up, we have not had a single bird strike. Uh, some people might feel that it looks intrusive, um, but from the outside looking in, it's not that visible. And I must say my office is covered in it and it took me a very short time to get used to it. And it, it really does not, um, you know, cover up the outside world for me to be able to enjoy from my office. And there's a lot of different patterns, small squares, long lines, thick lines, thin lines. Uh, you can make all sorts of patterns and it really does work. It's proven to have worked. Um, so it's definitely a great solution to a home window or even a business uh, window solution. And there's a lot of others. And these are just some that you can look up, Kaleidoscape and Feather Friendly Decorative Films, and then Acopium Bird Savers. And there's others as well. But taking a look at Acopium, this is a little different system. It is basically, um, you could lack for better wording, strings that are strung in front of your window. Uh, and then they have a bottom edge that holds them in place. And, and this also breaks up that field of view for the bird. The birds are seeing something other than just the trees. And they say, oh, there's something in front there. I really don't want to go that way. And, and we'll you know, go a different direction. 
so this has also been a proven method that has worked at nature centers and businesses and homes that I've heard about. Um, and this is something that you can get uh, from them, or you can try to make something very similar fairly easily at home as well. Um, and then there's always, um, of course, shade, shade and, and other structures that are, you know, that you can put up in front of your windows that will help. But there's also all these more um, solutions that you create, more of a creative solution that could be something that your kids help you with or your grandkids, or maybe you're a good artist and you wanna make some really cool looking glass that looks like it's almost stained or etched. Um, and those all work fairly well. The thing that it's needed to be remember is one or two lines across the window probably is not enough. It needs to be fairly extensive uh, and more like fairly close like these things are here where there is a network of different uh, lines or dots or something across the window. If you just put two lines across that big window there probably would not be enough. Uh, anything helps, but, and there's also decals that have birds on them and things like that that you can put up. But as long as you put enough of them, that's the main key I think in making sure that birds see them and does not strike the window. Commercial buildings, as, you, as in this picture here, um, often have a, a large number of birds hit them as, in, in certain places, at least in certain cities. Um, and birds just think there's an opening. And once again, they hit that window. And most of the time, they're not able to survive that window strike. And uh, as sad as it sounds, they basically hit and, and oftentimes break their neck on impact. And so they're dead as soon as they hit. But um, anyhow, so anything we can do to reduce the bird deaths from windows is, is a good thing. And then there's skyscrapers. And I know these pictures down here are alarming, but they are pictures of birds being collected in cities underneath these tall towers. During migration especially, and uh, especially during inclement weather, these um, Skyscrapers, as we call them, especially with all these mirror windows and, and uh, large windows, birds just have no idea what they're flying into. And the lights inside these buildings are attracting the birds in migration at night. So the lights bring them, they, they don't really see an obstacle, they hit it and they just fall down. A lot of these birds we never even see because predators will pick them up. Uh, cats, crows, rats, whatever happens to be down there. Um, and, and we don't even find them. But uh, there is people that do studies on this. And they go out after heavy migration nights, especially if maybe it's bad weather, fog and, and rain and such. And then uh, these birds are attracted to these lights and circle them and hit them. And these people are documenting what is being found. And those birds that are alive, uh, try to take them to a rehab facility and and, uh, and get them help. But these pictures here are just basically from one night uh, or one night, morning of, of, of walking around a building down in downtown of certain cities and picking up birds, uh, which is really, really sad and really alarming. And if you add all these numbers up, you can see why the numbers are so high uh, of bird deaths from windows every year in the United States. It, it doesn't take a lot of these events uh, to add up. And here's another solution for that, for the lights out problem. So um, there's many different entities in the United States and Canada and other parts of the world that are now catching on to this. And they are trying to help out. Uh, they are creating these lights out events. Uh, they put out alerts and they send out Facebook messages and emails saying, hey, this is gonna be a really heavy night of migration. Please turn off your lights in these buildings. And there's a lot of cities that are joining in. I know the Houston Audubon is working really hard and Lights Out Texas is another organization um, that are working in quite a few of the towns and cities of, of Texas and the United States uh, to try to get the word out to the building owners and to the building maintenance people and, 
and to the people working in the offices in these buildings that, hey, at night, just turn off your light when you go home. Uh, there's no need to have that on and it just attracts the birds there. Um, and this year, Lights Out Texas has a campaign from April 19th through May 7th. And I know GCBO and Celeste have been part of that as have Houston Audubon and, and many others here in Texas. Um, there's also beginning to be a trend of bird friendly building designs. Uh, and I say a beginning of a trend and hopefully it'll build. Uh, but I know there's people out there really working hard on this. Uh, Heidi, as I mentioned, being one of them earlier. And there is some design concepts that really do help. Of course, less windows, but the way the windows are put in on angles, uh, the way the actual building is designed, the way it faces, how tall it is and so forth. There's just a lot of different, and I'm no expert on that by any means. I just know that it's out there and I've read a little bit about it. And so I know there is building concepts and designs that are now taking form that really do help this issue and this problem. The, uh, and, and I don't think I have this in here. I don't think I put it in, but um, what do you do if you find a bird that's hit a window? And let me just talk about that real quick. And, and I know we had, uh, I believe it was yesterday, uh, uh, Dana with Gulf Coast Wildlife Rescue was on and talking about uh, exactly probably this. Uh, what do you do if you find a bird that's hit a window that's laying in your yard or laying on your patio or laying outside your business? Um, you know, the best thing to do is pick it up right away, gently put it in a box, a cardboard type box or some sort of small uh, enclosure that has a towel on the bottom and just let it rest quietly in the dark in a quiet room for a while um, and then check on it maybe in 30 minutes or, or so or an hour and see if it's if it's doing well if it's ready to go but the best part to do is to take it to a wildlife rehabilitation center if you can get to a, a wildlife center uh, that takes care of birds and rehabilitate birds and animals that is really what's needed because as we mentioned earlier, some of these birds that come to and fly away, they do have internal injuries and they have some injuries that are sustained in a way that they won't survive and they will need help. So at least put it in a box and monitor it for a while. And if you can't, if there isn't a center, or if you can't get to it, absolutely, or, or get someone to take the bird, then uh, if it's releasable, release it, but otherwise get it to that, to that uh, wildlife rescue place. So another thing that um, actually is, is a huge threat to birds is cell towers and similar towers. Uh, and there's been a lot of studies and I've done studies myself um, around cell towers in years past. And weather oftentimes plays a big part in, in why there's bird collisions with cell towers. Uh, foggy or rainy nights, Birds are attracted to the, to the white blinking light or white light that shines on top of the cell towers. And um, they circle the tower, uh, trying to figure out what's going on. And they hit the wires that hold the tower up. They're called guy wires. These are steel cables. Uh, this picture might not be the best of, of representations that I have here. It was one that I grabbed, but um, the guy wires are oftentimes a main concern uh, as these birds fly around the tower somewhat disoriented by the light and the storm and they hit the wires and they fall to the ground. And just as skyscrapers, studies are done underneath these towers the next morning and you can sometimes just find a bird or two or, or you can find dozens and dozens or hundreds of birds depending on the time of year and the migration and what is going on and also the weather. Uh, some, some solutions um, to, to this is uh, the lights have been studied and I think they're finding that red lights are a lot less attractive to the birds than the white lights. So putting red lights or red blinking caution lights uh, on these towers is one way that the industry can help reduce uh, bird strikes to cell towers and other towers. 
and it has been working to some extent. And, and I see more and more towers with red lights on them as I you know, drive around at night or, or look around in places. Um, smaller towers I've seen in some towns, and, and this is sometimes for aesthetic reasons, but, uh, <laughs> but they've also been clad and look like trees instead of looking like a cell tower. Um, and, and, but the shorter towers don't have as many wires and therefore not as much of a threat also. And then there's power lines. And I don't know, I have not found a study on how many birds are electrocuted by power lines. Um, I'm sure it's out there, uh, but uh, larger birds, especially birds of prey, cranes, vultures, uh, eagles, hawks, uh, you know, large birds like that, that can touch more than one wire at a time, uh, wings stretched out, shorts out through the bird and they're electrocuted. Um, and this happens not just with the huge, large power tower as the picture uh, above there with the crane, but also smaller, uh, regular electric lines uh, that run through even your neighborhood or out in rural areas or wherever they happen to be. And there is solutions that will help some. And as you can see in some on the picture here on the right, uh, these are these are devices that that help um, shield the bird from the electricity or from the wires. Um, Center Point Energy, I must give a little shout out to. Uh, they have come to GCBO to, to our headquarters at Gulf Coast Bird Observatory in Lake Jackson, Texas, and they have put up all bird friendly um, conductors and, and, and covering of the wires. And so they have reduced that ability for birds to get uh, electrocuted. And that, that is a company that's trying to do that in many other places. And I know other uh, energy companies are doing the same. And uh, the more of that we can see, the less uh, electrocuted deaths there will be uh, you know, by birds on power lines. And then there is cars and trucks. And I don't know how many of you have experienced this, but I, I am one. Uh, I've had it happen a couple of times in my lifetime that uh, a bird will fly right out in front, will strike my vehicle. And um, the times that I've stopped, that bird has always been dead. It's too much of an impact for a bird to survive. Um, and oftentimes it's larger birds. Um, Owls and night birds are notorious for being hit by vehicles. Uh, they hunt along the roadsides at night because there's rodents and snakes and especially rodents uh, running around in the grasses along the roadsides. And these birds are crossing the road to get from one side or the other, or they're chasing a mouse out into the road and get struck by a vehicle. They have, they have no concept of what's going on around them when they're hunting. Once they hone in on a, on a prey item, say a mouse, basically their whole focus is that mouse and they don't really hear or see much of anything going on around them um, when they're hunting. So they're so focused on what they're doing that even the car that's right by them, they don't really pay attention to it and, and they don't understand that threat. Uh, the other bird, his, this is a barn owl that's in the picture with the car, uh, very susceptible to car strikes. And there's an egret on the other side here, uh, which larger birds, uh, raptors and vultures and egrets and herons and, and, uh, and owls and such, and night herons are, are really susceptible to car strikes. And there's 80 million some vehicle strikes per year in the USA alone. Um, I, I remember just last year during migration, there was uh, near our house here uh, where, where we live, um, there's a real nice row of trees on both sides of the row. It's a little bit out in the country and it's kind of like going down a lane of trees on each side. And there was a group of maybe 30, 40 Eastern Kingbirds working between those trees. And uh, there was one dead in the road and we almost hit one as we were driving, narrowly missed it. And so it, it is, is a real common occurrence and a problem. And much less of an issue, but very dangerous 
uh, is the um, bird strikes to airplanes. And the FFA uh, say there's been about 142,000 wildlife strikes and 97% of those are birds. Uh, so, you know, close to 140,000 bird strikes with aircrafts in the United States alone between 1990 and 2013. So that average about 4,500 per year. And uh, we can safely say that those are all, uh, you know, th those strikes all related in death for those birds. And you can see the damage that a black vulture, I believe it is, uh, can do to, a, to an aircraft that's uh, you know, a smaller personal jet, but nonetheless, pretty good sized airplane. Um, and so airline strikes are not one of the biggest killers, but it certainly is an issue. And it also is an issue for humans and the aircraft, of course. Uh, which is a danger. And here's a somewhat controversial subject, uh, windmills, wind, wind farms. And I know a lot of us support green energy, including me and, and GCBO uh, supports green energy. Uh, windmills can be a large issue for birds, uh, especially those that are placed in migratory patterns or migratory routes of birds. Uh, and I've seen a lot of that happen uh, here in Texas along the coast, uh, which is, you know, maybe a good place for windmill because it generates a lot of wind and so therefore power, uh, but they're placed in some areas that are heavily used by migratory birds, songbirds and raptors alike and, and other birds, but especially songbirds and raptors. And, and that can be a problem. I don't have a picture of a dead bird in this slide, as you might have noticed. Uh, well, for one, I'd like to keep the gore to a minimum, but more so, there just isn't a ton of information out there. A lot of, um, a lot of wind companies might do studies ahead of time to see what's there and then mitigate that, that fact, or, um, they don't do any at all because in Texas, there is no laws concerning that as far as what you have to do ahead of time. Uh, it comes into federal statute and US Fish and Wildlife regulates any bird kills uh, by, by the uh, laws that are put in place to protect birds. Uh, Migratory Bird Treaty Act and the Threatened and Endangered Species Act governs uh, you know, if, if, if a bird is harmed in any way. Um, but there's nothing in place yet that really says what a windmill has to look like, what it has to do, what it has to, what it has to do ahead of time, or what it has to do to protect birds during its existence. Um, so um, the studies that are done are often done and not released to the public. And so it's, it's hard to get some of those numbers. Um, and, and therefore I didn't put a picture in here because I didn't have one. The other cost besides just being there and being a strike is the, the habitat fragmentation that some of these wind farms create. And if you look at that lower picture there, you'll see all the roads and the infrastructure that's put in. Um, and that basically fragments the habitat and fragmented habitats is a lot less likely to be useful to not just birds, but animals in general. Um, and a lot of the prairie birds and grassland birds are affected by uh, the, these uh, very large wind farms that fragment these habitats. Um, birds that have been in, in these grassland type situations around windmill farms have been noticed to have disappeared from those areas. Uh, whether they just move on or whether they're strikes or whatever it is, I'm not sure that we know, uh, at least I don't, but fragmentation of habitat at any time is, is a big issue and it's a problem. Uh, and so while we want green energy, you know, for wind farms to be placed somewhere, it needs to be really strategically correct uh, to harm as little as possible. And more so probably in Europe than here, but uh, the offshore windmills that have now been placed in so many places 
uh, can also cause a huge problem for migratory birds and wintering birds that winter out there, believe it or not. There are species that winter out in the middle of the ocean, certain ducks and certain other bird species that, um, that just hang out <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. And, and these wind farms are a problem for them. And there is there are some solutions being worked on. There's different windmill types. Um, the newer generation windmills are probably, I must say, safer than the first generation of windmills that came out. Um, there is some stop measures in place now when there is storms or when there's heavy migration going uh, going on that these are automatically shut down or remotely shut down for a period of time that. Um, that is being advised on to the company that runs them, uh, that there's heavy migration in the air, please turn off the windmills. Uh, and, and to some extent that is happening in some places. Uh, more and more of that needs to happen and there needs to be much more friendly bird designed windmills put in place uh, as far as I'm concerned anyhow. And another problem with windmills is bats. There is probably more bats harmed than there is uh, birds. And um, that is something that's being studied. These bats are flying around the windmills. A bat doesn't weigh much. It actually gets sucked into the vortex of those blades. And uh, they might not even be struck by the blade, but the lungs explode or implode inside the bat just from the suction and from the pressure that, that exudes into the bat. And these bats just collapse to the ground with their lungs exploded or imploded and, and are dead. Uh, and that's happening in large numbers. So bats have a really tough time with wind turbines in certain places. So that once again, um, location of these are, is critical um, to where we put them and to the animals. And I wanna talk about a few non-strike threats that are uh, human cost as well. Um, it's not just all things that they fly into or hit by. Um, there's also some other threats that are huge that are, are created by us, whether we like it or not. Um, and one of them is trash. Uh, I know Celeste and Splash with ABC and, and uh, uh, Black Cat GSI and Gulf Coast Bird Observatory as a partner is tackling this as well as many, many other organizations in Texas and through the United States and through the world. Um, plastics, especially on, in our oceans and on our beaches uh, present a huge problem. And you can see the gull there that has a uh, six pack plastic thing wrapped around its uh, neck and it's stuck. Um, you can see the bottle caps and many other plastic items inside the seabird um, that it's been eating. And, um, and it's not just birds that do that. Mammals and sea turtles um, have a huge problem with this as well. So picking up our trash off the beaches and, and uh, out of the ocean um, is a huge thing for birds and uh, other mammals in the ocean. Fishing line is also an, a huge problem. Uh, not just the line, but the hooks and the lead weights and the floats, uh, the little bobbers that come with fishing. Uh, I have nothing against fishing. I grew up fishing. I like fishing, although I don't get to do it very often anymore. Um, but it improperly discarded and, and fishing line has been left or tossed or uh, get caught on something and just forgotten about or left there to catch fish uh, and you walk away or whatever. Uh, is a huge, huge problem on the coast and around inland lakes and to some extent rivers as well. Um, these are all photos by, uh, that I got from Sue Heath, our uh, GCBO avian research director. And these are pictures taken along the coast here. Um, you can see terns and cormorants. Uh, and I believe that is a little, I guess it's a heron of sorts up there hanging. Uh, a pelican, a white pelican with a hook through it. Uh, just recently here at the house, uh, me and Denise rescued a uh, neotropic cormorant that was caught, had a hook in the wing and a bunch of line wrapped around it. So this is something that we see in the field 
not daily, thankfully, but very often. And sometimes our staff is able, um, luckily, to be able to catch these birds and while they're still alive and untangle them, give them help. If they need to go to rehab, we will take them um, or release them if they seem okay. Unfortunately, sometimes the damage is already done. These birds are dead. Uh, or as you can see in the lower picture here, this is one of uh, quote unquote Sue's oyster catcher babies uh, that she uh, monitors along with the rest of our staff. And um, you can see that it's been banded. And so it's part of the program and it lost a foot uh, due to a uh, line that was wrapped around it and basically strangled it off till it fell off. Um, I know, I think it was two years ago, I know they caught a handful of oyster catchers in a short period of time that a fishing line wrapped around them. Um, and it's, it's such a detrimental thing that is so easily solved. It's just a matter of picking up after yourself, taking the trash home uh, and not throwing it out there. And balloons, <laughs> balloons are uh, fun. Balloons are colorful. Balloons are awesome at the kids party and wherever, but they're also highly, highly detrimental if you are going to let them go uh, or leave them out or just not dispose of them correctly. Um, I know that on a beach survey that we did down at Matagorda Peninsula, um, and I think the record unfortunately has been broken since, but I remember counting 178 balloons that we picked up within just an hour of driving down that beach. Uh, that's 178 balloons. That's a lot on just a stretch of beach. And the balloons themselves are dangerous to sea turtles and birds that like to try to eat them. Uh, they might think that they are um, jellyfish because they look a lot like a jellyfish floating in the water or on the beach. Uh, but also the strings that are attached to these balloons is really, really dangerous. Um, sometimes the birds are targeting them for nests and put them in nests and then the young actually are strangled or get entangled in them. But oftentimes it's out on the ocean or on the beach that they go up and peck on this and then they get entangled and they cannot survive that, um, as you can see here in these pictures. And so it's really important and there is solutions to this. Um, basically don't release balloons. Don't let them go. It's, it's that simple. <laughs> don't have balloon releases uh, for events or graduations or weddings or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, you know, do not release all those balloons because eventually they will find a way into nature. They will find a way into the ocean. Um, and I, I find balloons in all the weirdest of places, middle of wildlife refuges and parks and out on the beaches all the time um, in large numbers. And we know these are detrimental. And to me, I'll be honest, this is nothing more than littering, uh, letting go of all these balloons and letting them fly uh, because they are gonna come down and they're gonna be litter and they're gonna be dangerous litter somewhere. And then, a maybe even more controversial subject is, uh, is cats in the wild um, or cats outdoors. It is estimated uh, by knowing or you know, studying saying that one cat in a year will kill or can kill 55 birds by itself. And then you extrapolate that by the millions of cats we have and you will easily get to the number of 2.4 billion bird deaths per year in USA alone. And that's not just birds, uh, that number is birds, but um, lizards, small snakes, um, all these things that are actually very beneficial to us. Lizards get rid of insects, snakes gets rid of rodents, um, and, and cats are highly detrimental. Uh, outdoor cats are highly detrimental to to the population of these. I love cats. I've had cats, indoor cats all my life. And I actually, I'm gonna backtrack because when I was younger, I did not have indoor cats. I had outdoor cats. I did not know, I did not think about that. Um, it felt like cats should be outside. It felt like they would do really great. 
But now that I look back on it, every one of those cats eventually disappeared, either by being hit by a car, um, got in a fight with another animal and eventually died from that, from those injuries, uh, or just plain disappeared and no telling what happened to it, but um, it's really rough on a cat to live outdoors. It's not simple and they are not native to this country. Uh, they were brought here. So it's not a native part of the food chain. It's not something that was there in the origin. It was not something that was meant to be there uh, where we live here. And so it is a big problem and it is a huge problem. Um, releasing your cats outdoors will be detrimental to birds, lizards, snakes, and other animals. Um, I, I know a proven point that uh, at the Valley Nature Center where I worked for so many years, uh, there was parks all the way around us and there was cats all the way around us and there was cats in the park. Uh, and we had a campaign to try to, you know, let homeowners know to keep cats indoors. And as fewer and fewer cats were in the nature center, more and more lizards, more and more snakes, more and more birds showed up. That park was virtually lizardless. <laughs> there was no lizards at that uh, nature center when I first started working there. But as people started understanding and as there was less cats, lizards started appearing. And there was quite a few, bit, uh, quite a bit of lizards um, that are very helpful to us. So cats, is a very sore and, and hard subject to talk about because we all love our cats. A lot of us feel that maybe they should be outside, uh, that they like it better outside for whatever reason. Uh, but personally, as a, as a um, cat owner, I feel it's so much safer for the cat to be indoors. They live a much healthier life and a longer life. And, uh, and the wildlife outside is protected. So uh, to me, that is, it's, it's a simple solution to a really, really big problem and probably really the biggest man-made threat in the USA to birds every year. And then there's habitat loss and we've talked about this for many years and decades and we all probably know about it, um, but habitat loss is a big problem. And especially here on the Texas coast where we're at, we're located on the upper Texas coast Bird migration, especially in the spring where birds fly over the Gulf and, and land on the first stretch of green habitat that they can find on the Gulf Coast. And they need that to be able to survive because they've been flying for 18, 20, 24 hours or more. And they have to have somewhere to land. They have to have somewhere to sleep. They have to have somewhere to drink and eat to be able to continue their migration journey. And so these hapo, uh, stopover habitats, as we call them, are crucially important to bird migration. Without it, bird migration couldn't function. And without migration, the birds won't function. So that is how crucial habitat is in many areas, uh, in all areas, really and truly, uh, because migration goes, out, goes everywhere. And it's not just migration that's an issue. If you don't have habitat, you're not going to have birds. It's that simple, no matter where you are. Um, so setting aside property and developing it in, in a sensible way. Uh, there's just so many ways that we won't get into here today that, that we can help birds by setting aside land, developing it properly and not as intrusive and, and so forth. Uh, but remembering that everything we do really has an effect. And, and a, a very famous um, naturalist once said that and I'm just not quite going to say the words exactly the way they, they were said by him, but uh, anytime we pull a string in nature, something else in nature moves. So everything is intricately put together. Uh, anything we touch will change something somewhere else in nature. Um, so we might think, well, we're only removing this one thing. Well, that by doing that, something else is removed and therefore something else can't eat and then something else is removed and down the line it goes. And I think maybe this is the last slide, but um, climate change is a huge problem. Uh, what, no matter what side of the coin you are and how you believe in, in what's happening, uh, 
the climate is changing. That is no denying that. Um, that is proven no matter how we look at it and what, why it's changing, it is changing. Um, sea level rise is definitely happening and we have you know, seen that right here with our oyster catcher study uh, that we do here. With, it's in its 11th season now, I believe. And more and more of the islands that the American oyster catchers have been roosting on, that have been feeding on, and even most importantly have been nesting on are going underwater. They are disappearing underwater. Uh, some of them are being washed away, but others that are still there are just basically disappearing underneath the sea uh, because of the, the rising levels of water. And, and they're being washed over by the tides, which are now higher than they were before because the sea is higher, which has become a huge problem. Um, here in the upper Texas coast and even central and probably lower Texas coast, uh, American oyster catchers face a real uncertain future and could be extirpated within 10, 15 years from this area from breeding. Uh, they might disappear from here, from this area, because uh, they don't have the habitat no longer required for them to nest on these little islands out in the bay and in those areas. The frequency of storms and the intensity of storms from the climate changes whether it's winter storms or summer storms, doesn't matter, but the intensity have increased and, and the number of storms have increased. And that's well documented. And this picture here was taken on the bottom here. You can maybe see that that was a hummingbird. Um, and that is on Bryan Beach here in Brazoria County after uh, Hurricane Harvey. And it just shows that migration is tough to begin with. Uh, when they hit a storm, uh, they're not going to make it. And I know storms are part of the weather, it's part of the world, but the intensified one and the, and the frequency of them is more. And so that is definitely uh, a problem that we are, that we're able to actually study and, and see firsthand daily as we work in the field uh, at GCBO. So in closing, um, I basically want to just draw your attention to all these things and, and ask that anything you can do to, to try to help those situations, to try to alleviate some of those situations that we saw here today, whatever it is that you can do would be you know, much appreciated by not just me and our staff, but by the birds themselves, especially. Um, this is a wonderful picture uh, or a, or a, uh, a uh, painting uh, that was donated um, by an ex-president of, of the Gulf Coast Bird Observatory to the observatory. And uh, it shows um, the birds coming home through a storm going into the, to the shoreline, seeing the habitat, and they know that they're safe. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a, a really potent, picture in a way when you think about it. And, and I ask that you are um, con cognizant of all these issues and, and please try to get involved. Please try to help however you can. Uh, you can look on our website and, and um, you can reach out to us. Um, uh, just Google some of these things, see what you can do to help. There's a lot of organizations, not just us, but trying to work on this and you can help them by volunteering maybe supporting them in other ways. Uh, and, and there's so many things that you can do to, to try to help this and nothing else spreading the word and becoming a an ambassador for, for the bird life out there and, and all the other wildlife as well. So I thank you for doing that. And um, I know we have a little bit of time here and if there is any questions, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to answer those. Um, if there is any, I don't know, Celeste, if you have any or. Yeah, um, anybody who wants to ask questions, there's still time for that if you want to put those in the comments. Um, so why do some birds die from collisions uh, while others are fine and can fly away? Sure. So it, it, it's much like a car collision that you're in or, or a collision that a human would be in. It depends on the impact. It depends on how hard you hit. Uh, 
depending on how fast the bird is flying, what angle the bird is flying in when it hits the window or whatever the object is. Uh, it might just be turning and just kind of hits its wing or the side of the body and it's not that hard of an impact. If it comes head on and it's flying hard or fast, most likely it will break its neck on impact. So it depends on the speed of the flight, the, the direction that the bird is coming in, the angle that it's coming at. Um, and and that, that's the main reason. Um, some birds that hit hard, they might look okay, but they hit hard enough that they've ruptured a lung or they've ruptured some sort of, uh, they're ble bleeding internally. Um, so they might live for a few days even, or they might live for a few hours, but it really depends on the impact. Um, are there certain species or groups of species that are more prone to strike? It seems, it, it depends on the strike, but migrating songbirds seems to be the main thing that we find that, that strikes buildings. So that includes all our songbirds, our migratory songbirds, warblers and tanagers and thrushes and flycatchers and orioles. Uh, in migration, I think that's that's the, that's the time that most birds will strike a window. It, it happens in smaller numbers all through the year. I mean, we've had cardinals and we even had a pileated woodpecker unfortunately strike at the GCBO before we put the bird tape up. And luckily now since, it's been a couple of years since we had a bird strike. But the smaller songbirds that fly around homes and fly around businesses and skyscrapers tend to you know, hit more. Uh, same thing for cell towers and, and such like that. They're migrating. Um, and so in, in that, that, that group of birds is probably more, and that's a huge group. I mean, that's, that's, that's a large group of birds, all those birds. Uh, so there's not, I don't know per se of one species or even a small group of birds that is more prone. It's, it's a large section of our songbird population. Um, and then a question or even an argument that we hear a lot um, is what if I feed my cat? Surely it won't go kill all the birds outside if I'm feeding it. Right, right. And, and I've thought of that myself and, and I've read enough literature, talked to enough people that have studied this uh, that, okay, that might happen at times and there might be a few lazy kitty cats around that when you feed them and make them nice and fat and they use you know, they lay around a lot, uh, but the natural instincts of cats, of our, you know, uh, cats that we, we have domesticated uh, is to hunt. It's built in them. Um, they're born that way. Their mother teaches them to hunt. Uh, when, when we have toy mice in the house, they stalk them, they hunt them, they play with them, they bounce them, they chew on them. It's what they do. Uh, it's it's maybe gruesome to think about, but th that's just how they're built. They're not they're not mean, evil creatures in any way. They just they they are an animal that instinctively, and it's built in them, will hunt uh, even when they are fed. Because I have seen my cat when in my younger years when I had cats outside, catch a mouse, bring it to the house, bite it really good to where it's bleeding play with it for a while, and then just walk away from it. That was fun. I had my good time. Uh, bring lizards in, half eaten, and leave them there. They never go back to eat them. They just leave them there. Um, and Denise Kaplan, if you're watching, you you know what I'm talking about. Because Denise used to work for us, and <laughs> she always used to complain about a cat leaving a lizard in her bed. <laughs> so um, that is a, a, a proven fact that they can be indoor outdoor cats that are very, very well maintained and fed very much so, or even outdoor cats that are fed twice a day, uh, they're still bringing birds to the door. So it's still an issue, unfortunately. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Martin. Um, that was, like you said, kind of a hard topic, but it's important that we talk about these things. Birds aren't, you know, just all sunshine and rainbows. We're, we're trying to protect them. There are issues surrounding the birds. So Thank you for talking about that. Um, next up, we have a presentation from the Houston Arboretum. So stay tuned for that. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you there. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.